Let's go ahead and bow our heads and pray and ask God to uh, speak to our hearts this morning. God, we thank you so much for this rich opportunity to once again come and celebrate you, worship you, and receive from you. Lord, I ask that you'd speak to our hearts this morning. Speak to our situations this morning. Speak to our everyday life this morning. And Lord, may we be equipped and empowered by your spirit to go out and carry the message of the good news to others who have yet to hear it. May we be the good news that they're thirsting for, that they're, that they're longing for. And Lord, as you bless us here at Relevant, I ask that you bless all the other great churches in Riverside and beyond. We lift up Sandals Church, Harvest Christian Fellowship, the Grove Community Church, Generations Church, City Church, the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. Lord, thank you so much for Elevate Life Church. Lord, I thank you for the Baptists, the Methodists, Pentecostals, Charismatics, Calvary Chapel, Catholic, our Catholic brothers and sisters, Seventh-day Adventist brothers and sisters. Lord, I know that on a, on, on a, at a season like this, we are all celebrating one thing, not ourselves. We're celebrating you, Jesus, because, because if it wasn't for you, none of us would be in church. So thank you, God. And if anyone would receive your word this morning, may you save them because of the preaching of the word. And Lord, may they hear with ears of faith. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone shouts, amen. Amen. Lord, we ask that you speak this morning. How many of y'all came to hear a word from God this morning? Yes, yes. We might have a little church. I don't know. We'll see where this ends. And I want to let you know something. I might start and not end the sermon just because they've got me on time constraints and whatnot. They're like, we need to get you out of here. So some of you are still got Christmas shopping. Who still has Christmas shopping to do? Who has not started their Christmas shopping? I'm raising my hand as well. Everyone in my family receives love from me. Just I'm giving you love unconditionally this time. All the other times it was conditional. <laughs> oh, man, so good, so good. You know, we've been doing this series called Great Expectations. How many of you guys have been receiving something from that? The Great Expectations. And, and, and the thing about expectations, I, I, I remember... Growing up in, in, in Berrien Springs, Michigan, and when I was in, in like middle school and high school, I played basketball. Like I was, I was a, I, I thought I was going to be a basketball player for sure. I was, I was determined. I was good at the game. I just did not have the physiology to match my heart. But, but I thought I was pretty good. I would follow all the other players. And, and I remember my, my, one of my best friends, uh, Dari Demetrius Asakoma, uh, he, he lived in Indiana for a while. And he came back from Indiana uh, in the summertime and, because summer was all basketball. It didn't matter if it was 90 degrees weather, 102 degrees. It didn't matter. We played basketball from morning to evening. Right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody about that life? But he came back from Indiana and he says, man. I have met and I have hung out with the next Michael Jordan. I'm like, who is he? Sean Kemp. High school game. And it's like, we, 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 we knew these guys when they were in high school. Like, oh my gosh, that guy's going to be amazing. And then in Chicago, about an hour's drive away from us, there are two individuals in Chicago going to a, a little private academy. One of them was by the name uh, Ronnie uh, Floyd. Anybody remember Ronnie Floyd? Great expectations. For Ronnie Floyd, I'm sorry, Ronnie Fields. Ronnie Fields, anybody remember Ronnie Fields now that I got the name right? No, anybody? No. And you call yourselves basketball lovers. Ronnie Fields was, was the can't miss guy. He was in high school. They, they were predicting that he was going to be the next Michael Jordan. And, and one of his classmates and teammates was another gentleman by the name of Kevin Garnett. Can I get an amen on Kevin Garnett now? Yeah, you know, Kevin, but Kevin was on his team, but Ronnie Fields was the one that everyone was hoping for. They had great expectations for this guy. One of them went on to sign what was at that point the biggest deal, $123 million contract. The other one played for the CBA, which we all watch, and became a bench warmer. Great expectations placed on these individuals. I have friends who have kids who, who they're, they, they, they're trying to live out their, their best life through their kids. Anybody? That's me too, right? But I have friends who are like, you know, they're athletes in school and, and, and now they're putting all the pressure on their kids. Like, you know, oh yeah, we, his football career. And I'm like, what do you mean football career? 
career. I didn't have a career in school. Like, you know, I had a, I had a study hall career. But they talk about all these things, like their, his career and all these things, and, and they put all these expectations on these kids, and they're like, you know, he's going to be great. And, 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 you know, you can see the pressure that's on the kid. And in my own family, we had a great hope for a football player that, that would do some amazing things. He had won awards and he had been pl- seen by many different uh, um, uh, scouts who come and check him out. But still, when it came to pass, it was an expectation that did not fulfill. Are y'all following me this, this far? You know, you, you look at the Bible and what you see is that the predictions that were placed on Jesus were very great. They were great. From, from Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve fall into sin, and they're in trouble, and then God shows up, and he's like, where are you, Adam? And and, and sometimes you may think that he's saying, where are you, because I'm coming to punish you. No, God was like, I'm coming, I want to find you, because I want to give you the good news. You messed up, but look at this woman who you think messed up. The seed of this woman is going to crush the head of the serpent that deceived you. And right there we get the first great expectation of Jesus. He is going to crush the head of the serpent. And then in Isaiah chapter 9, where we'll be reading from this morning, in verse 2, you kind of see the, 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 the scope of where the, the, the uh, children of Israel were at and the mindset. It says this in verse 2 of chapter 9. It says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them has light shined. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the trampling warrior in battle, tumult, and every garment Rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for the fire. And then verse 6. For unto us a child is born. For unto us a child is born. And I want you to really, really get the, the, the passion behind that statement. For unto us. It's not there's a child that's been born somewhere. No. For unto us. This is our boy. This is our hero. He's been born to us. We, he's the pregnancy that we've been waiting for in our own family, in our own bloodline. For unto us. That, that, that seed that was prophesied in Genesis chapter 3 is being birthed in this prophecy. Are you following me so far? For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government, of peace, there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord will do this. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. There is no other prophecy, listen to me, there's no other prophecy in all of Scripture that has more excitement than this prophecy. For a people who've been oppressed, for a people who've been, who've been exiled, for a people who've experienced uh, uh, turmoil and, 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 and pain, for a people who need advice, for a people who are tired of war, for a people who are tired of people who make promises and never deliver on them, for a people who are tired of, of rulers and leaders that divide the people, hello somebody. This promise is, is, is amazing. He's going to be the wonderful counselor. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now I want to break down a little bit uh, so you understand what, what these, these titles mean, these expectations that are being placed on, on, on Jesus. Wonderful Counselor, what that means is, is one who determines upon a plan of action and, 
carries it out. One who determines a plan of action and carries it out. Jesus plans and, and, and he has purposes and he, has, he designs and he decrees what should be and because he speaks it, it is. Oh, I'm, I need more than like three amens or two, you know. Some of y'all are just kind of like, yeah, that's, uh, that's not Jonathan speaking. That's the word of God right there. Hello, somebody. Yes. He'll be the top advisor. For those of you who like mobster movies like your pastor, mm, I watch them for sermon research only. He will be the consigliere, the wonderful consigliere, the one who advises and, and has the, the plan of action, who makes moves, who tells you the moves to make. He'll be a quali. I, I like this. I like to think of him. He is the qualified counselor. The reason why he's qualified is because, is because in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, it tells us that, that, that we have a high priest, Jesus, who, who, who is touched by our infirmity. That in every single way, he has felt our, 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 our weaknesses. Are you following me? Have you ever gone to speak to someone to receive counsel, Heather? And, and, and they're looking at you, and, and you know, judging by just their appearance and the degrees on their wall, you're like, you have no context or no idea as to the shoes I've had to walk in. And here you are trying to give me advice on how I should make my life better when you don't even understand. You don't know the life. You are not about that life. Oh, I, I've had conversations with people. I've met, I've met with people. They're like, and I'm, I'm telling them, listen, I'm a pastor. I'm a, I'm a preacher. I'm a teacher. I'm an apostle. I plant churches. I am not a therapist. You need to go see a therapist about this. And they'll tell me, I don't want to go see the therapist because the therapist does not know where I came from. They don't know what I've been through. And I want to tell you that this wonderful counselor that you find in Jesus is a, is, is, is a priest who has, who has felt everything you feel in every way. He can empathize with your brokenness. Oh, my God. For unto us a son is given. Unto us a child is born. You want to understand the, the gravity and the weight of what that statement means. It means this, is that God is in heaven and he looks over at the earth. And the thing is that maybe you would not be able to relate to him or become related to him because you'd see him as someone who's up high. And so what God does is he says, you know what? For me to fully understand their context, I am going to be born in the way that they're born. I'm going to experience haters the way that they experience haters. I'm going to experience temptation at every degree that they experience temptation. So that when, when, when they look at me, they can see, oh, he's walked my walk already. And he has overcome for me. Are you following me? He, he came down. For unto us a child is born. It's telling us that this God is a God that you can relate to. He's a God that's been birthed in your situation. Are you following me this morning? Are you with me? Come on, somebody, say amen to the Lord right now. We have a counselor that cares, that's with us. 1 Peter 5, 7, it says, it says, cast your cares on the Lord. Why? Because he cares. He's not watching the clock thinking about billing. He actually cares. Are you with me? He cares. He's seen every possible solution. To your problem. And he wants to, get, here's the thing about trusting God. Because here's, here's what happens. A lot of times, Pastor Jeremy, a lot of times we like to only take the big things to God. Right? We, we, we don't want to go bother him with like, you know, the menial, small things. And I want to let you know that in, in the Gospel of Luke, it tells us that, that the type of requests that you are to bring to God, the type of problems that you're to bring to God are the other uh, elementary problems. There's a parable that Jesus gives. This isn't even in the notes, but I'm going to give it to you anyways because I'm not watching the time anymore. Hallelujah. <laughs> There's a parable that Jesus gives. He says, which of you, if you, if you had someone show up in the middle of the night and, and you had no food in your house to, to feed the person, would not go at 3 o'clock in the morning to your neighbor's house and knock on the door 
and ask him to lend you some bread. Which of you would do that? Because I need to know which neighborhood to avoid. Right? And, and the thing about that parable is like it's a simple parable. But, but, but the, the context of the parable is that, is that a person who goes to his neighbor to ask for some Nutrigain bars just so that he's not offending his guests that have showed up. And it's a pathetic, it's like, well, this is so simplistic. Why would you bother your neighbor with that? And Jesus is saying, bother me with a neutral grain problem. Bother me with something ridiculous. Bother me, knock on my door with something so small that, that you'd be embarrassed to tweet about it. Bother me with that stuff. Because here's the thing about it is that when you start bothering God with the small problems, guess what? It's the little faith fulfillments that he comes through on the small things that prepare you for the big things. The reason why some of you evacuate your faith is because you never trusted him with a paper cut. So when they hit you with cancer, you freak out. Sometimes you got to pray for the paper cut. Ooh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a quotable right there. Pray for the paper cut. It builds trust in the small things. He can only become a wonderful counselor, a top, a top advisor in your life when you start leaning in with the small. Mighty God. They call him mighty God. The expectation that he would be a mighty God is an expectation of power and strength during warfare. Strength and vitality of a successful warrior. And, and, and then the statement that he is God, mighty God, says it all. He's all powerful. And at Christmas time, uh, my, my favorite, one of my favorite movies, I, I don't even know why I like this movie, but I just like Will Ferrell. <laughs> Talladega Nights. This, this, this is scripture, this is Bible concerning the Christmas story. For unto us a child is born, a son is given, uh, uh, and his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. And in Talladega Nights, we think of Christmas or, or Jesus as the five pound or seven pound, six ounce baby Jesus. The infant holy, infant meek. We think of Jesus as, as this, you know, just the turn the other cheek, weak person. But the prophecy and the expectation of Jesus is mighty God, successful, conquering king God in your life. Everlasting father, it's an expectation of care. It's not like a, 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 a contradiction between him and God the Father. It is an expectation of his compassionate fatherly care for his people, a provider forever. And you see this compassion played out in how Jesus would see the crowd and have compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. The everlasting father. The expectation of him as prince of peace. Now, a lot of times, you know, my, 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 my daughter, Zara, she, um, uh, she, lo she loves Frozen, man. I've been letting it go in my house for the last <laughs> two years or so, three years. We've just been letting it, let it go. She's got all the dresses, and my goodness, watch out on the days that she wants to wear the Princess Elsa dress. It's like, I am I'm like, Zara, I'm not Zara. I am Princess Elsa. I'm like, well, you're Princess Zara to me. Zara is not a princess. It's only Elsa. I'm like, okay, I will not argue with you. But, you know, we have this idea of, you know, prince and princesses and everything. The, the, the term prince of peace here is speaking of a commander, a commander, one who holds authority. Are you following me? A leader, a military commander. In other words, the type of, the type of uh, uh, child that's been born unto us is a commander of peace. He will step into your storm and command peace to the elements that you feel as if cannot be controlled. Peace be still is what he does. Commander of peace can have these expectations. And these were the expectations that the Jews had on Jesus, 
on the Savior that was to come. They had these types of expectations. Now, I want you to pay attention just real quickly to, to some of the things that, that are being said in this, in verse 6. It says, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. Are you, are you following me, right? We can, we can spend pretty much a few weeks just in this passage. But the government shall be upon his shoulder and, and he'll establish the throne of, his, of, of David and over his kingdom and, and uphold it with justice and righteousness. At the time of Christ's birth, they were in captivity. They were a colony of, of Rome. Israel was not known as Israel. It was known as South Rome. Are you, are you following? Galilee was like one of those lakes that Rome owned. And so when Jesus shows up, they're expecting someone who brings government, who, who, uh, who brings a, 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 a revolution that changes the system that they're used to. But what do you do when God shows up to you in a different way? What do you do when God shows up to you in a way that you don't expect? What do you do when Jesus approaches and, and comes into your life a different way than the way that you're hoping for, the way, that you're, the way that you had read the prophecy to come? What do you do in that circumstance? <laughs> I, I, uh, I, 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 I have a phone voice. I have, I have a phone voice. It's my, it's my phone business voice. The, the, this is the voice that gets you contracts. I can't use the same voice at the barber shop, but this is the voice that I use when I'm on the phone. Hello, this is John Belima. I'm calling on behalf of MSI Partners. And uh, the reason why I'm calling is because I'd like to speak to Mr. Johnson. I, I believe I can, if I can set up an appointment with him, I'd like to go over some matters that I think would be beneficial to both parties. Listen, look at my LinkedIn. <laughs> I'll send you a performer. And then what happens is that you get the appointment or you meet the people, and, and, and I walk into the room, and they're like, yeah, we're, John? <laughs> you, you, I, you're, n never mind. You're welcome. Come on in. <laughs> All I'm thinking to myself is, oh, he expected me to be much taller. I'm sure you want. He was expecting me to be taller than 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 than. <laughs> Anybody else have the phone voice? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. My my, my parents have. My mom has a phone voice and and and, and um, uh, a house voice. Growing up, growing growing up in an African home, you you get to. That's where I learned phone voice from. That's where, you know, you're, you're going crazy, you're in trouble, and she's like, I am going to beat you. Phone rings, hello, good night. <laughs> Praise God. Ah, I'll call you back later. Like, where are you? <laughs> Bring me my belt. Everybody has phone. Mira, mira, mira. Then I can get on the phone. Hello. Everybody has phone voice, right? And then when you meet the person in real life, you're like, oh, that, you just, oh, man, I was not expecting that. Not expecting that. Okay, Kevin Williams. Yes, I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't expecting it. The thing is, is that we have certain expectations of what the person of notoriety is supposed to arrive, uh, how they're, the vehicle that they're supposed to come in, the clothes that they should be wearing. I mean, you see the celebrities whenever there's a gala or, or some sort of award show. Everyone's talking about, oh, she's wearing a Vera Wang this morning. He's wearing this outfit. This is the, the red carpet that's rolled out for these celebrities. There's a certain expectation that you'd have for someone who's been prophesied as the wonderful prince of peace, the wonderful counselor, the, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the one whose government will be on his shoulders surely should come a certain way. And God shows up in the New Testament to the nameless and the faceless. 
God shows up to the nameless and the faceless. I, I want you to see something, what's happening. I, I, like I said, I, I read the Bible a little bit strange sometimes. And, because I like to have fun with the Bible, amen? Did you know you can have fun with the Bible? The Bible is fun. Fun, fun, fun. The Bible is fun. I like to read the Bible because it's fun. Amen. Just made up a song for you. That was, should get a Grammy. Luke chapter 2. From Isaiah chapter 9. Unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and the zeal of the Lord will be in him, and he'll have a throne of his father David, and all these things, these great things. I want to show you something about how he shows up. That lets down everyone's expectations, and they miss it. Luke chapter 2 verse 1. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of, of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. I, I'm going I'm to read that again. I'm going to read that again. Here's why. I want, I want you to understand what's happening. I want you to see it. Okay? So, so pay attention here. I want you to imagine that I'm James Earl Jones or Morgan Freeman. Okay, and this is a Ridley Scott movie or something, or I'm, who's that Brit the, the Australian guy from Gladiator? Uh, Ru Russell Crowe, imagine this is a Russell Crowe narration, right? <clears throat> In those days, a decree went from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. We have notoriety. We have power. We have government. We have important, important cities being mentioned. And all, verse, verse 3, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up to Galilee <laughs> from the town of Nazareth to Judea, the city of David, which is also called Bethlehem, because he was the house of the lineage of David. To be registered to marry his pregnant girlfriend. A teenager who's pregnant, kind of like your neighborhood. We see a lot of that around here. And while they were there, time came for him to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in some swaddling clothes. And they laid him in a manger, you know, because they were poor. Because there was no place for them in the inn. Th th this is the breakdown. It starts up here. And it gets very ratchet very quickly. It gets country. We, we start in Beverly Hills and we end up in, in Riverside. Or we start in Riverside and we end up in, in Hemet. We, we start out in Syria. We start out in Rome with Caesar Augustus. In the, we start out in D.C. with the president in the White House. We start out with the governor's mansion. And we end up in a town called Bethlehem in Nazareth. To us it means something. But back then, Nazareth, even back then they would speak about Nazareth. They will say, can a good thing come out of Nazareth? Is there any industry in Nazareth? Is there anything in Bethlehem? Yeah, yeah, those Jews have an affection for David, but for them it meant nothing. This is not how a king is to come into the world. This is not how one whose government will be on his shoulders is to come into the world. What happened to the pomp and the circumstances? It's a downward Spiral. And the birth of Christ comes to faceless people and nameless individuals. 
For us, it's amazing that wise men from the east came to visit Jesus. But to the Jews, these were pagan devil worshipers who were rich, but they were devil worshiper dog Gentiles who were looking for some star. They didn't care. Text goes on in verse 8 and says, In the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. We have this romanticized idea of shepherds. Shepherds weren't allowed to enter the city. This would be like in the same region of Southern California, there was a place called Skid Row and people who lived in tents on the street and the angels showed up to them and said, the king is here. Go and announce it. Or like, you know, they wrapped him in swaddling cloths. No, let me tell you about swaddling cloths. Um, swaddling cloths were for people who were just po. Too poor to afford, afford the O and the R, just po. When they didn't have antibiotics to take care of the baby after it came out, what they would do is they'd get as many spices and, and whatever it is that they could find, and then they'll wrap the baby up real tightly in swaddling cloths and pray that the baby survives. Because they had no medicine. That's what swaddling cloths meant. That's why Luke puts it in there to let you know that this Jesus was born in the lowest of the lowest and the people who announced it and got to witness it first were the faceless, the nameless, the rejects, the people that you would not even care about, the people you would not write about. If he was born today, maybe the headlines and the news would say something like Congress or, or, or the government is experiencing a partial sh shutdown. They'll never mention that Jesus, who's changing history, has been birthed. And the birth to insignificant people, to an insignificant audience, at a dark time, was all scripture being fulfilled. It was all scripture being fulfilled. God breaking into, into time and changing history. Now from heaven's perspective, the birth of Jesus was spectacular. From heaven's perspective, it was awesome. From heaven's perspective, this was amazing. From heaven's perspective, this was, this was glorious. On earth's perspective, it was mundane and disappointing. In earth's eyes, this was the worst condition for a king to come into this planet. From heaven's perspective, it was awesome to think that the eternal, immutable, everlasting God would wrap himself up in flesh and dwell among men. All of heaven was like, this is amazing. In earth's perspective, the baby was born on a hit list. He was born on the run. You don't hear this too much in the Christmas stories, but the, 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 the surrounding of, of his birth was him hidden in exile, had to go and, and sneak in the border of Egypt to hide from mercenaries that were out to get him. First perspective, this was the worst condition. But God, let me tell you something. God is strategic. He will hide you in the worst circumstances because he's preparing something great in and through you. He will, he will preserve you in a place that looks so small. Oh, y'all ain't with me this morning. Y'all ain't with me. You think that this is just Jesus, but let me tell you, this is Abraham. This is Moses. Moses, born and hidden in a basket and put in the waters and hidden in Pharaoh's kingdom, out in exile. This is how God works. This is how God worked with, with, with Joseph. The worst conditions are God's hiding you and preparing you and preserving you for him to fulfill a work in and through you. That's how God works. Never despise your circumstances. Never look at somebody and say, oh, if I only had it as good as them. No, God has it as good for you where you are. Because he's preserving, he's preparing, and he has an agenda. From earth's perspective, man, these people are broke. From earth's perspective, man, she's kind of ratchet. From earth's perspective, her credit is jacked up.
from Earth's perspective, they don't have the educational qualifications to make it happen, to make it in this world. From Earth's perspective, you should never even attempt what you're trying to attempt. From heaven's perspective, yes, I like it when there's no option for you. When I am your only option so that when you make it, you can tell everyone, had it not been for the Lord who was on my side, I would have never made it. So you can bring glory to the one who it's due to. You're probably wondering, how come I don't have all these things? If you had all those things, you would only blame yourself for your success. Perhaps God has you where you're at just so that when you get to the other side, you can say it was God all along. You can have a retro praise, amen, somebody. Because you were complaining back then, but now you can look back and say, thank you, Jesus, for being there for me. Thank you. From heaven's perspective. He was born just the way that God planned it. In earth's perspective, he was born in a situation where, his, where Joseph's girlfriend Mary had to explain to Joseph, it's not what you think. It's not what you think. And everywhere they went, everyone knew. They were, they were just engaged. They were betrothed. And, and they were like, oh, so y'all just skipped everything, huh? No, 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 it's not what you think. The Holy Spirit, yeah. I'm from San Bernardino. I know how these things work. <laughs> from Earth's perspective, there were no palaces. There were no guards. There was no surgeon on call just in case anything was going to go wrong. There was no midwife. There was no doula. They were not doing a home birth. Weird people. I'm baby number four right now on the way. And everyone's like, are you, gonna guys, are you guys going to try something different, like a home birth? I'm like, no. I need a surgeon. I need, I need a doctor, like, in the next room. Amen, somebody. My, my, my wife, now, now that's not, if you do home births, that's fine. I, I'm just saying that um, my level of faith is not like yours. Amen. <laughs> my wife just had an ultrasound a few days ago, like a couple weeks ago. And she came home and she was like, oh. Jonah, my doctor, Dr. Martin is pregnant too. And I'm like, okay. She's like, and I was worried because if she's pregnant, we're, all, we're both pregnant at the same time that she won't be able to, to you know, to deliver the baby. And, and, but then I heard good news that my other doctor who had moved away, Dr. Caruso's coming back. And so maybe Dr. Caruso can, can deliver the baby. And, 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 but then Dr., Dr., Dr. Martin said, it's okay because I'll be there even though I'm pregnant to catch your baby, Pauline. And so I feel so much better. I feel so much better. Oh, I'm like, babe, in my head, babe, what would you do if I said we have to go have the baby in a barn? <laughs> With farm animals. The cow will be the midwife. <laughs> it will not be sanitary. There will be cow leftovers. Straw and all other kinds of things in, in the room with us. I, I, Earth's perspective, there's nothing cute about a manger. A manger, some of y'all don't even know what a manger is. A manger is where the animals came to eat. Cow saliva. What was his antibiotic? And I want to give this to you. If you're taking notes, external circumstances may look challenging, and it doesn't mean that Christ is not there. Your external circumstances may look challenging, but it does not mean that Christ is not there. Just because your circumstances look bleak, it doesn't mean that God is not at work. It doesn't mean that this is not exactly how God is planning it and building it for your life. Heaven is looking at your situation with bated breath. Stephen, I can't wait till he sees the other side of this. I can't wait till he understands that I just cleared his schedule for greater ministry. I can't wait. 
until he sees the other side. See, the glory was never in the furniture that he laid in. Or the environment that surrounded him. The glory, in earth's perspective, the glory only matters in the surroundings. But in heaven's perspective, it's, it's, it's what God's intent that matters. Are you following? Uh, uh, let, me, let me go deeper with that. See, the thing is, is that it's, it's the abstract things that your accountant cannot chronicle that God is measuring. It's the abstract things that your neighbors and the Joneses and, and the people on Instagram face, those people can't see and, and, and perceive and they won't like what they see around you. But God is in a different dimension of measurement, of outlook, of possibility, probability. Perhaps your life will never make it on an HGTV show. But God's still building a life. Amen? It doesn't matter where you live. It matters what family's inside the house with you. It, it doesn't matter what your family eats for Christmas this year. What matters is who are you eating it with. It, it doesn't matter uh, what kind of gift you receive. Sometimes what matters is who the gift came from. Oh, hello, somebody. Have you ever been so overjoyed that, 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 that Boo or Bay went to McDonald's and got a $1 apple pie from McDonald's and put a candle on it and gave it to you and said, you're the best thing that ever happened to me? Hello? Doesn't matter. And I think that in the Christmas story, Jesus and, and God is trying to teach us that what we expect on the outside should never dictate the inner expectation that the Spirit is guiding on the inside. Should never be the, the, the barometer as to whether or not God's at work in your life based on what's happening on the outside. All of Jerusalem, all of Bethlehem, all of the world is in darkness, is in turmoil. And God announces his birth to shepherds. An angel shows up and they sing glory to God in the highest. And all of this is private. It's something that's happening in this family in a barn with this baby that's been given such an awesome expectation as to what his life will mean for humanity. And I want to tell you this, if you take notes, here's point number two. It's not really a point, but it's a thought. The unexpected work of God is all around us. God's great expectations are being fulfilled all around us. God's greatest expectations for your life are in the process of being fulfilled. Hang in there. Hold on this Christmas. The Christmas story is, is, is a story of the greatest fulfillment that changed the course of this planet. And for those of us who may wonder and ask yourself the question, what is God expecting of me? What is God expecting of me? Can I give you a freebie? The problem with expectation is that most of our expectations have nothing to do with God. It's okay if we go on a little rabbit trail for a second before we close this thing up. Right about Christ's death on a cross. Jesus speaks to one of his disciples, one of his inner circle disciples, Peter, and says, Peter, you're going to deny me. And Peter's like, oh, heck no. I love you. You're my boy. I got your back. Way back. Jesus is like, Peter, you're, you're going to deny me, Peter. No, no, never, never, uh-uh, uh-uh, no way. 
I'll never deny you. Peter, you're going to deny me three times, my dude. That's how Jesus spoke. <laughs> and Peter cussed, so he probably says, oh, I'll never deny, beep, 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 I'll never deny you. And the battle between the two was what Jesus expected Peter to do and Peter's expectation on his own ability. Did you get that? Our problem with God is never what he expects of us. It's what we're expected to accomplish. I am a C. I am a C H R S A I N. Amen. And I will, I'm a super Christian. I will never fail the faith. And God Almighty is like, Pastor Richard, you're going to mess up. I'm okay with it. I'm good. I still accept you how you are. I'm still going to raise you up to be the leader of the church. You're still going to be the one who's going to preach at Pentecost. You're, everything that I've promised to fulfill in and through you is not going to be messed up just because of a bad day and a bad night with a girl who claimed so, that, that you knew me. The summation of your life is not going to be sur surmised to one single mistake, Peter. I'm a, I understand that. Don't get wrapped up in your ability. Stand on my promise to deliver you out of your calamity. And so when Peter denies him, he's, his life is a mess. And Jesus is like, yo, you're still my boy. Let's go fry some fish together. Let's go barbecue some salmon. So what does God expect of you? He expects to accomplish everything that he began in you. May that be a gift to you this Christmas. He expects to fulfill and accomplish the work that he began in you. He who began a good work is faithful to finish it until the day of salvation. He expects that the power that he's placed on the inside of you has, is the same power that resurrected him from the grave. He expects to accomplish and fulfill every promise that he's spoken over your life. And he does not expect you to have it all together. What can you expect from him? John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, will not perish but will have everlasting life. Are you with me? God's expectation of sending his son into this world was so that he would save you and that salvation was with all finality. Are you following me? It was accomplished. It was done. You have a double-handed security in Christ. So if you're here this morning and you're wondering, I don't know where I stand with God, let me let you know the good news is this. For unto you a child is born, a son has been given, wonderful counselor, the prince of peace who will come and command peace in all your troubled areas, the one who will show you and guide you the way how you should walk out this life, the everlasting father who will always be an everlasting provider for your life is who I give you this Christmas. And the government will be on his shoulders. The responsibility, the responsibility is no longer on your shoulders. It's on his shoulders. I am leaning on the everlasting arms of Jesus because the government, the responsibility is on his shoulders. And he does not say that with a hope. God did not give his son hoping to save you. He did not give his son Wishing that it would work out. He gave his son with an expectation that if I put my son up on a cross and he's buried into the ground, when he comes up on the third day, he will rise up and Rebecca will be rising up with him. Felicia will come up with him. Mike will come up with him. Harold will be coming up with him. Jeremiah is coming up with him. And it's with final clarity. 
authority of a king. God expected it. So what can you expect from God if you want to be saved this morning? You are saved. If he's moving in your heart this morning, the expectation of God to bring you to this service was for your salvation. The prayer of prayer, I invite you to pray this prayer with me. The prayer of salvation. The prayer of restoration. A prayer of God's expectation being accomplished in this moment. With every eye closed and every head bowed. If you're a believer, pray this prayer with those who are praying it for the first time. Dear Jesus, I expect you today to enter into my life, to change me from the inside out. Forgive me of my sins. I repent of my ways and I turn to you. You are my God and today I am your child. In Jesus' name, amen.